This morning's scripture is in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 33, verses 18 through 23. Hear the word of the Lord. Then Moses said, speaking to, to God, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will pro proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I, ha I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. This is God's word for us this morning. We know everything is made for a purpose. Nothing is not made that does not have a purpose. So we take something like these pair of glasses, which may be yours because they were left here, so feel free to claim them. These are made to put on your face to help you see better. Right. This bottle of water was created to hold water so that pastors, when they have dry mouth, can sit up here and drink. This pencil was made so that we might be able to write and to communicate together. So everything that's made is made for a purpose. Now, of course, we have been made as well. We've been made by God. And so it's right for us to ask, well, if everything's made for a purpose and we've been made by God, what is our purpose? I love how the Westminster Confession, this is a several hundred years old confession, answers that question. They put it like this. They say that the chief end of man, the purpose of man, is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That is our purpose. That is why we have been made. To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Now, of course, the people who put this little phrase together, they didn't just whip it up out of the air. They took it because they believe that is what has revealed to us in the Bible. Take, for example, Romans 11.36. There we read, For everything comes from Him, speaking of God, everything exists by His power and is intended for His glory. Everything is for His glory. To Him be glory evermore. Amen. In the last book of the Bible, Revelation 4.11, we read this. The angels are, this is a vision of, of the angels in heaven and what they're praising God about. And they're saying, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created everything, and it is for your pleasure that they exist and were created. And then God speaks in Isaiah 43, 7, saying this to the prophet Isaiah. I have made them, speaking of humans, I have made them for my glory. God has created us for his glory, and thus our purpose individually, each of us, and our purpose together as a church is to glorify God. Now you might wonder, well, why is that the case? Why is the meaning of life, why is the chief end of man to glorify God? Or as the Reformers put it, why is it sola deo gloria? Glory to God alone. Why does God deserve our glory alone? Well, if you think about it, this sola, sola Deo Gloria naturally and logically follows and flows from the other solas we have covered this fall. Sola gratia, for example, which means we are saved by God's grace alone. He is the one, God is, who initiated the plan of our salvation. He is the one who executed that plan through his son, Jesus Christ, which leads us to another sola. Solus Christus, Christ alone. Jesus alone is the one who did the work for our salvation. We did nothing to earn it or merit it. Jesus Christ did the work for us. And since our salvation cannot be earned through good behavior, we are saved by another soul, sola fide, by faith alone. Only thing that God seeks from us is a faith that trusts Him to do the work for us that we can't do. It's like we're drowning in the middle of Lake Huron, 
And God's the one with the helicopter. God's the one who lowers the ladder. God's the one who climbs down. God's the one who extends the hand. All we do is grab on. That is faith alone. Grabbing on to God and his work that he's done for us. No wonder God deserves all the glory. He's the one who's done all the work. Sola Deo Gloria. Now that, of course, answers our why question. You know, why should we glorify God? But still we need to answer two others. How do we do that? And what does that actually mean? How do we glorify it? How do we glorify God? And what is glory? What is the glory of God? What is God's glory? Well, those two questions are going to take up our remaining time today and our next sermon in two weeks on this subject, because next week we're going to have a special Thanksgiving uh, service. And we're going to try to answer the how, how do we do this, and what is it. Today we're going to focus on the what, though. we got to start there. Because if we don't understand what glory is and what God's glory is, we will not be able to accurately and thoughtfully answer the other question of how do we glorify God. So that's what we're going to do today. And the question then is, what is glory? What is it? That's the million dollar question. Glory is not easy to define. Uh, I'm going to give you the dictionary definition, and it's, it, it is what it is. Here's what the dictionary definition is. It is, glory is high renown or honor. It's magnificence or great beauty. It's praise and worship and thanksgiving. It's to take great pleasure or pride in something. That's what the dictionary definition of glory is. But that doesn't give us, get us even really close to understanding what glory is. <laughs> really is, especially God's glory. It's like asking, well, what's beauty? What's beauty? Well, the dictionary definition of beauty is a combination of qualities such as shape, color, or form that pleases the aesthetic senses, especially the sight. Now, if someone asks you what beauty is, is that how you're going to answer? No. No. Because beauty is watching your bride walk down the aisle. Beauty is holding your newborn infant in your arms. Beauty is um, sitting on the beach on Lake Michigan in a summer evening watching the sunset. That, that's, that is what beauty is. It's not this dictionary definition. And the same thing goes for this idea of glory. And if that's true of just the word glory itself, it's even more true when we talk about God's glory. But you've got to start somewhere. So I'm going to give you words. Words, all right? God's glory, what is it? Well, it's who God is. It's the essence of his nature. It's the weight of his importance. It's the radiance of his splendor. It's the demonstration of his power. It's the atmosphere of his presence. That's God's glory. God's glory is the expression of all of his goodness and all of his intrinsic, eternal qualities. That is the glory of God. Now, unfortunately, like I said, these are just mere words projected up on the wall. And definitions do not really relay the true understanding of the significance of God's glory. For if we were to really know God's glory, if we were to really experience the glory of God, we would drop to our knees, and we would do so without even thinking because our legs would not be able to hold us up. Our mouths would drop open. Silently, we would just go... And no words would be able to come out because no words could capture that experience of encountering the glory of God. Encountering the essence of his nature, the weight of his importance, the radiance of his splendor, the demonstration of his power and the atmosphere of his presence. There are no words that can accurately capture the glory of God because the glory of God is the supreme and infinite worth of God. And so this idea of our inability to handle, to describe, to experience the fullness of the glory of God in our sinful, imperfect states is brought home in the Old Testament's physical, physical descriptions of God's glory. You see, the glory of God not only refers to all of these kind of internal, intrinsic characters and qualities, you know, that His holiness, His perfect love, His omnipotence, but the glory of God also refers to to when God wants to display this external for us to see. Outward manifestations of these perfections for us to experience. 
Wherever God makes his presence known, wherever his presence actively dwells, that is where the glory of God is. So if we go back to Exodus, uh, after God delivers his people out of Egypt, he leads them, of course, to Mount Sinai. That's where the whole Ten Commandments were. And there at Mount Sinai, Moses meets with God on the mountaintop. And we read this description of that mountaintop, what it looked like in Exodus 24, 15 through 17. When Moses went up the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of God, of the Lord, looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. So the glory of God takes the form of this cloud and fire. And it shows up at the end of the book of Exodus 12, after the Israelites set up the tabernacle of God. We read this in Exodus 40. Then the cloud covered the tent of me, that's the tabernacle, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of Eden because the cloud had settled upon it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And just for good measure, we see the glory of God in the form of a cloud also appear in Solomon's day when they had finished building the temple of the Lord. Remember, the tabernacle was this impermanent structure they would uh, put up and tear down and take with them as they traveled. But once they settled in Jerusalem and in Israel, they built a temple that was much grander than the tabernacle that was to stay put. And we read this when they built the temple and they were dedicated. 1 Kings 8, 10 through 11. When the priest withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and the priest could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Now what should, make, now what should we make of this fact that when the glory of God appeared in the Old Testament, it was manifest in the form of a cloud? Now typically when we think of clouds, we think of those white, puffy uh, cotton balls in the sky on a beautiful summer day, set on, the, you know, on a beautiful blue sky. Well, what happens, of course, when those clouds up the beautiful sky get a little bit lower? Well, I think we understand that living here in Somerset, and any time you get up about 7 or 8 in the morning, you try to drive around, there's fog everywhere. You can't see. It obscures. It hides. It causes two-hour delays every other week for Addison. It's pathetic. <laughs> but this cloud was far more intimidating than a foggy morning, for when it was on Mount Sinai, it was described as a dense cloud, like smoke from a furnace, and it produced lightning and thunder. And that was just during the day. At night, this cloud was described as looking like a consuming fire on the mountaintop. David Vandernen, in his book, God's Glory Alone, he put it like this. Putting these various clues together, I surmise that the cloud was like a brilliant fire surrounded by dense smoke. Daylight dimmed the appearance of the fire while its brightness shone in the dark. And of course, if you were one of those Israelites, no wonder they didn't want to go anywhere near that Mountain. They're like, Moses, why don't you just go for us? You're good. We, we're, we trust you. And they're probably wondering if Moses would even come back down. It would have been amazing to see. But of course, more astounding than the lightning and the thunder and the fire was the fact that this was the dwelling place of God. It was where God made his presence known to his people. In the Psalms, we read verses like this Psalm 97, 1 through 2 says, the Lord reigns, let the earth be glad, let the distant shores rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. They're thinking of the Exodus. They're thinking of Mount Sinai when they write this. Psalm 99, 6-7 says this. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel was among, among those who called on his name. They called on the Lord and he answered them. He, he spoke to them from the pillar of cloud. They're thinking back to Exodus. So, 
Why did God do this? Why did God obscure and hide his presence in the cloud? Well, we know that this wasn't always the way it was. You remember back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had direct access to God. God was not hidden in a cloud or a pillar of fire. He was simply there with them. He was talking with them. He was showing them things. He was directing them. He was guiding them. But of course, after they sinned, disobeyed God, after they broke faith with the Lord, we read this in Genesis 3. Verse 8, it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord, God, as he was walking in the garden of the cool, in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. Now, I, I, some of you, I had a couple of you asked me, and somebody asked me just a few weeks ago, why did Adam and Eve hide from God? I mean, it's God. I mean, come on. Or they really think they're going to go into the, the bushes and like, not think that God would find them or something? Why did they actually hide? Well, a possible answer that was raised by one of my seminary professors, his name was Dr. Jeffrey Niehaus, he makes the claim that in verse 8 here, that there's been a mistranslation. Where it says that they heard the sound of the Lord in the, um, in the, cool, in the garden, in the cool of the day, that that phrase right here, it's underlined, the cool of the day, in fact, doesn't mean cool at all. In fact, this word never means cool anywhere else in the Bible. It means wind. In fact, it means a strong wind, like the wind of a storm. And so what they're suggesting is that the sound that they heard of the Lord God coming into their midst was a sound like a tornado coming their way. As one author puts it, the resulting interpretation is that Adam and Eve heard the terrifying sound of God going through the garden with a storm wind. If so, then God is coming in judgment because of their sin, rather than a daily conversation, which explains why Adam and Eve hightailed out of there and went and hid. You see, because of their sin and rebellion, no longer do Adam and Eve have direct access to God. No longer is God's presence a complete comfort to them. Now God's presence also brings with it judgment and fear in response to to their sin. And this, of course, explains why the glory of God is now obscured in the cloud. You see, it's for their protection. You know, these uh, descriptions of the glory of God talk about fire a lot. And fire is an apt symbol for God's presence. Because uh, we got a firefighter back there, Tim, and he knows about this. Tim knows that Fire in a fire ring, that's a good fire. You go, you can sit around it, you can get warm by it, you can even know roast marshmallows. But a fire out of control in your attic, that's a bad thing. That is a fire that consumes and destroys. And if you're asleep or unconscious, you, it will consume you without hesitating. Fire is good, but depends on the context. It can be very, very bad as well. And that brings us to this interesting passage that we read earlier in uh, Exodus chapter 33, where Moses, who had witnessed the glory of God going before his people as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night, who also met with God on the, top, on the mountaintop of Mount Sinai in the midst of God's glory, now here in Exodus 33, Moses asked God to show him his full glory. No longer hidden in the fire, no longer hidden in the cloud. Moses wants to experience God's glory full on. He's like, just bring it. And you know, that's not a bad thing in one sense. That, that is a good longing. That, in fact, I want to say is the ultimate human longing. To meet and know your creator in all of his fullness and all of his greatness. To know God, not through a fog, not through the smoke, not through the cloud but to see God clearly, to know God in all of his splendor and beauty, that is a very good desire. In fact, I want to say that's the greatest desire that we can have. Because if you think about it, if we're honest with ourselves, most of the time, what we want is not God. Most of the time, what we want is things. 
from God, what God <coughs> can give us. Good health, you know, protection, <coughs> money, stuff. A lot of times we want what God can give us rather than God himself. And, and we know that just by how we pray. Listen to your prayer sometimes. I mean, I do this sometimes too, where I spend most of my time praying for stuff. Maybe for myself or for you guys or for others. And I don't spend as much time just praying to God, thanking Him for who He is, praising Him for what He's done, and just asking for more of Him. Now, certainly all of us have a ways to grow in this area. But the hope is that, you know, the more you grow in your faith, the more you learn about God and who He is and what He's done for you, hopefully our wants and desires turn more and more to wanting God and so it's just the stuff God can give to us. And that is where Moses is in his faith journey. He wants God for God's sake. And is sick of the cloud and the fire and the smoke. He's saying, God, show me your glory already. I want to see it. I imagine Moses like sick of drinking from the, from the, the garden hose. He's putting his mouth right over this open fire hydrant. He's saying, all right, just turn it on. Let me, let me have it all. Let's And here is God's response, probably shaking his head at Moses, saying, oh boy, here you go. And the Lord said this. Oh, let me go back. The Lord said, or Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you can stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. All right, what's going on here? This this passage is kind of weird, isn't it? Because, you know, we believe that God, that the Father, God is spirit. So all these descriptions of God's face and God's hand and God's back, what is going on here? Well, these are best interpreted in one of two ways. Either this is just an anthropomorphism, which, of course, is simply describing God in human terms so that helps us understand who God is because we're like little ants compared to him. So an anthropomorphism, maybe that's it. They're just talking about God's hands and his face and his back. It's not really his hands and face and back. Um, and it's not literally that. It's actually this. Here at the beginning of this passage, says, the Lord says, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. So some say, well, that's really what's passing here. It's not God's Face. This is God's face, in a sense. They're saying it is all of his goodness. So that's one interpretation. Anthropomorphism. I can't say that fast. The other way to interpret this passage is to say, no, maybe it's not an anthropomorphism. It could be an example of what theologians call a theophany. Theophany. So what's that? Theophany is where God appears to his people in the Old Testament in the form of a human being. We think of Jesus, right? Jesus was here in the flesh, in the form of a human being. The idea is that God, uh, there are certain times in the Old Testament where God appeared to people, you know, sometimes in the form of a burning bush with Moses, but other times, like with Jacob and Abraham, God took on the appearance of a human being. Jacob wrestled with God. You can't wrestle with the Spirit. You, can wrestle, you have to wrestle with another human being. And Abraham hosted uh, God and two angels, and, but they sat down together, they ate together. So these are uh, appearances, theophany, where God appears in human form. So either way, it could be, I'm not sure which way it was, uh, either, either way you interpret it, God is answering Moses' request to see his glory with a yes, but also a no. Yes, you can see more of my glory, and that is a good thing to ask for, Moses. Oh, boy, Moses, you have hit gold on this one. You know, 
You feel that sometimes when you pray for these things, and all of a sudden you pray for something that's a little bit more spiritual, and like, okay, that's probably the one that's going to get hurt. That's the more spiritual one. God hears them all, but here, Moses, God says to Moses, like, that's the right one, Moses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See more of my glory. That is a good thing. But you can't see all of it, Moses. You can't handle the fire hydrant. Why? Because in his sinful state, Moses cannot see the glory of God in all its fullness and live. He cannot bear the judgment that is due to sin that accompanies God's glory. Because remember, God's glory includes his perfect, all of his qualities together. Remember, his perfect qualities also include his holiness and his righteousness. And no sin can stand before the holiness and righteousness of God and not bear the perfect judgment and justice of God. So, on the one hand, God in his love shows Moses more of his glory. But, on the other hand, God in his mercy protects Moses by placing him in the cleft of the rock, by covering him with his hand. And this actually pretty much sums up Israel's entire experience of God in the Old Testament. God promised, I will be with you, Israel. I'm going to be present with you. I'm going to cause my great name to dwell among you. And this, of course, is a comforting and wonderful thing. But along with that would also come God's holiness, God's righteousness, because the glory of God is not like divided into these different things. It is all of these things together. Therefore, God's presence was with them, but it had to be obscured. It had to be hidden. It was always behind the curtain to protect them from his own righteousness and holiness for the time being. Literally, the presence of God was most manifested in the inner room of the tabernacle. So here's a tabernacle. Only the, on the outside, in this courtyard, that's where the Israelites could go. Any, any man or woman of the Israelites could be in the courtyard. This inner room of the tabernacle, only the priest could go into. And the most holy of holy places behind the curtain, where the Ark of the Covenant was, where God's presence was said to be right there, in between the cherubim statues on top of the Ark, there, only the high priest could go into once a year, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and only after giving, doing all these sacrifices and going through all of these ritualistic procedures could he go in there and be protected from God's holiness and righteousness and not die. In fact, if you know the story, what they would do for the high priest is they would uh, tie a rope around his leg so that the rope would be under the curtain, and if he went in there and he was impure, he would die. And so that way, no one else had to go in there and die getting him out. They could just pull his dead body out. That's how serious they knew to take the Holy of Holies, in God's presence, God's glory. And of course, this is true also for the temple. When they built the temple, the same sort of thing. Any Israelite man or woman could be in the temple courtyard. Now, there's a wall back here that if you were not an Israelite, you were a Gentile who worshipped God, you could only go up to the wall, and so you could only worship there. That's why Jesus got so mad when they set up all the... Uh, the the marketplace that in that spot, because that was the only place where a non-Israelite could go to worship God, and then you have all these people haggling over uh, animals to purchase, and there were money changers. That's where Jesus went in and threw the table over and said, God, get out of here. Here, in the temple area, only the Israelites could go to. The inner temple, only the priests, and here is the Holy of Holies. This would be a curtain right here, but they don't have it, so you can see through right now. And this is where the glory of God would be manifested. And so again, just like the tabernacle, only the high priest would go in there once a year on Yom Kippur. In essence, when God's people wanted to draw near to God, that required a lot of self-examination. That required a lot of repentance and confession. It required a lot of sacrifice and offerings. That is what all of this is pointing us to, it's showing us. That's what God is trying to help us understand. And in many ways, you still feel that today. When you desire to draw close to God, 
when you really want to get serious about your faith, you know you can't just do that without making some changes in your life, right? You know that if you want to draw close to God, you know there's going to have to be things you're going to have to do, like forgive those who hurt you, like not doing things that you know you should not be doing, doing things you know you ought to be doing. You know, if you really want to draw close to God, you know that has to be in place. It basically starts by humbling yourself, confessing and repenting of your sin. You don't draw close to God without starting there. Now, Israel in the Old Testament did that sometimes. But if you know the history of Israel, they didn't do it all too often. Most of their time, they turned away from God. They would forget about God. They would worship other gods, chase after other nations for their security and their fulfillment. And eventually we get to this very sad chapter in the Old Testament, in Israel's history, where in Ezekiel 10, the glory of God leaves the temple. And the glory of God doesn't just stop there. The glory of God leaves Israel altogether because of their ongoing, unrelenting, sin, and their unwillingness to humble themselves and repent. Here, Israel is the only people on earth, they're the only people on earth to have direct access to God, who had God's presence among them, who had the glory of God in their midst, and they forgot about it, and they forsook him. They had the essence of his nature, they had the weight of his importance. They had the rays of his splendor. They had the demonstration of his power. They had the atmosphere of his presence. And yet they turned their backs on God's glory. If you read the book of Ezekiel, you'll see how unimaginably painful this is for God's prophet Ezekiel to see and experience this. It's the worst thing he could ever have imagined happening. He would rather be killed by the lions than see the glory of God depart from Israel. But God, in his mercy, leaves Ezekiel and God's faithful people with this promise later on in Ezekiel, this prophetic vision of the future in Ezekiel 43. And we're going to finish with this today. Ezekiel says, Then the man brought me to the gate facing east. This is the gate of the temple. And I saw the glory of the, of the God of Israel coming from the east, his voice was like the roar of rushing waters, and the land was radiant with his glory. The vision I saw was like the vision I had seen when he came to destroy the city, and, uh, and like the visions I had seen by the Kibar River. And I fell face down. The glory of the Lord entered the temple through the gate facing east. Then the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. God's promise was that he was not done with them yet. Even though he had to depart because of their sin, it was going to be a temporary departure. God would return to his temple and would bring his glory and presence to it once again, but not in the way any Israelite would have ever expected or imagined. The glory of God would not arrive in a pillar of cloud, would not come as a fire, but the glory of God would come in the form of a human being named Jesus Christ, of whom John the Baptist would say this in John 1.14, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, and that glory is the glory of the one and only, of the Father, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Jesus is now the manifestation of the glory of God here on earth. All of the cloud and the fire and the smoke hid, Jesus showed. He was and is the glory of God in human form. Now next week we're going to celebrate our annual Thanksgiving Sunday. But in two weeks we're going to explore more fully this idea of Jesus as the glory of God and how he came and how we therefore ought to glorify God in our lives as well. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father,
your glory is too much for us to handle. Even if we got just a smidgen more of it, Father, oh, how we would, we, our minds would be blown away. We wouldn't be able to handle it. But Father, that is a right desire that Moses had for more of you. And I pray that would be our desire as well today. Not for the stuff you can give us. We don't want to make you just Santa Claus in the sky. Oh, that's pathetic. Father, we thank you in your wonderful mercy that when we treat you like that, you still love us and you still, sometimes you even give us things. You still bless us. But Father, may our hearts more and more just desire you. Long to know you more. To experience your presence among us. Father, what an amazing thing that is. That is what we were created for. That is our purpose, to know you, to glorify you, and to enjoy you forever. And that be the cry of our hearts today. May, and may that cause us to want to get right with you. Any sin in our life, may we humbly confess it to you. Help us to have a clear conscience with you and a clear conscience with others that we might be in a better position to experience your glory and experience more of you in our lives and in our church together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for